So today, as Ben said, today we're going to have a look at uh, support technology trends. Uh, we'll start with a very short presentation to describe uh, the main trends we are seeing in support. And then we will delve deeper into a, an interview with uh, Skyline on this uh, part of the content chain. As Ben said, please feel free to, to use the, uh, the Q&A box uh, at any time uh, during, uh, during this webinar. So let's have a look at some of the main drivers of change uh, in support. Uh, uh, support, of course, is a wide category, including a variety of products and services uh, uh, from uh, monitoring products, for example, to cloud computing solutions. Of course, the, the transition to IP uh, is having a huge impact throughout this segment as suppliers develop a solution to manage, uh, control, uh, and monitor uh, IP networks. Uh, this is also because uh, uh, IP, despite all its benefits, uh, uh, has added a lot of complexity uh, with the consequent need for suppliers to develop uh, easy to use uh, solutions. IP, according to our research, is driving most of the revenues for suppliers in uh, this segment, but is also bringing increased uh, uh, virtualization of work of workloads. Uh, and most suppliers uh, uh, in support are moving to software to enable this. This is, of course, a major transformation away from the dedicated products that uh, were commonplace uh, not so long ago. Finally, we're seeing uh, uh, data as becoming uh, increasingly important in this category, uh, like in other parts of the content chain. And the importance of data lies in the need for broadcast and media organization to automate uh, workflows with um, new technologies like uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and to have more information on uh, their operations. As a result of this, uh, uh, getting the data right is becoming extremely important for uh, suppliers as well. Uh, this, these are the most important drivers of technology demand in support according to IABM research. And as you can see, the focus is very much on the transition to uh, IP, as uh, suppliers support their customers' uh, uh, gradual move to IP networks. And as I mentioned earlier, this is leading to an increased virtualization of the technology supply and also to an increased importance of data, and most importantly, to drive uh, workflow automation as uh, customer budgets become more squeezed. So let me introduce our guest today. Uh, today we are joined by uh, Ben van der Berke, who is CEO of Skyline Communication. Uh, thank you very much, Ben, for, for joining us today. Thank you, Lorenzo. So I, I wanted to start from the very general by asking you, uh, as I usually do in these webinars, uh, uh, what are, in your opinion, the main drivers of change uh, uh, in support? Um, from in my opinion, I mean uh, a lot of things that you mentioned. You know, the transition to all IP, the increased virtualization. Uh, we see a lot of hardware which is transitioning into software components that need to be hosted on 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 data centers. And there's only one thing I would like to add there. I think sometimes it's very important, Lorenzo, to take a step back and to look at really what the essence is of what it, what is happening. Okay, and. The essence of what is happening here is, is something that we see everywhere uh, around us. Even if you look beyond uh, the boundaries of our own industry, the geopolitical landscape, global economy, the finance industry, electricity grids and all of that. One thing they have all in common is that these are ecosystems that become increasingly more complex um, simply because of the fact that we're connecting so many pieces together and everything is interacting with, with everything else. And as a result of that, you get a very complex environment um, that also exposes a nonlinear behavior. Um, that means that if I turn a button over here, you know, something else is happening over there. But I, as a human, I don't really understand what the relationship is necessarily between those two things. And it's also in a nonlinear fashion. So something happening on one side could have a big effect on the other side of things. And that's typically what we refer to as, as a VUCA ecosystem, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Um, and it's a very typical thing in these ecosystems um, is that they are very resilient, but on the other hand, 
you know, unexpected things can happen. Um, you can even refer to the US presidency or a Brexit or an airplane crashing. You know, those are all results of very complex ecosystems. And VUCA is something that starts to apply more and more towards our broadcast and media industry. And all the things that you mentioned there are really related to that. And you can see that on the business layer, the way we shape, we model, we supply and support services, and also on the technology layer. And if, you, if I can add one more thing to that, one of the key things that is very important for the broadcast and media industry to understand is that if you know that you work in that kind of more VUCA style of environment, agility is very important, okay? And everything that we do and all the technologies that you mentioned there, agility is really central in all of that. It's about agility in the sense that, I mean, agility is not speed. Speed is the ability to move from point A to point B very quickly. But point B in this type of ecosystem, the new broadcast and media world that we're seeing, point B is a moving target, okay? This industry is moving so fast in terms of business models all the way down to technology that you have to have the agility to respond to that very quickly. So I would say really, if you look at the essence of what is driving the changes that we see in support, it's really about agility. That's the key objective that we all need to strive towards. Okay, okay, and that's very interesting also because you've taken the perspective of the global economy, uh, other industries as well to explain the increased complexity in the mm -hmm. broadcast and media uh, industry as well. And I agree, oh, so agility, not just about speed, but it's also about adapting to the changes in the market, which are exactly. becoming uh, much, much quicker than before. But to come back on, uh, on IP, because uh, of course it's very important for your company as well. Uh, of course, these uh, flexibility, as, as we said, has brought these increased complexity. Uh, has this translated uh, into new requirements for more specifically monitoring solutions in your case? Um, most definitely. I mean, if you look at it from a technology perspective, you know, the, the transition to IP virtualization, it gives us flexibility, okay? It gives us uh, a lot of possibilities, a lot of options. But flexibility, you know, is, is that's only the ability to shape something in different ways. And if you understand that you have to be agile, it, it requires more than just deploying a flexible technology. And in that sense, I would say, it's not only about new requirements for the traditional monitoring and control technology that we have seen. I would actually dare to say that this change that we see in the industry is really fundamentally redefining the role of monitoring and control. Okay, so it's not just about evolving features or, you know, doing things slightly, slightly different. Um, if you look at it, you know, the monitoring and control has evolved from nice to have to a must have to control the quality of the services and all of that. But today it becomes a very vital and strategic component of the operations. If you look at it, I, and I always say, you know, what's the DNA of your services? It used to be the way you lined up boxes and the way you connected those boxes. Today, you know, it's more about, hey, I have that IP environment, how will I leverage that flexibility? And in order to do that, in order to build that agile operation to leverage that flexibility, in fact, the monitoring and control, the end-to-end -end orchestration and all of those components play a much more important role than ever in the past. And as a matter of fact, you could say, hey, you know, if you look at it from two perspectives, from a monitoring perspective, for example, none of the traditional approaches are going to work anymore, okay? You're looking at a nonlinear system that can have unexpected behavior and that even has disaster built into it, okay? So what we see there is that we need to apply artificial intelligence, machine learning to be able to deal with that. And that shouldn't come as a surprise. If you look to the other examples that I gave you, AI and machine learning is leveraged throughout the industry in different domains exactly for that same uh, that, that same challenge. If you look at it from a control perspective, you know, it's no longer about simple automation. Today, we talk about very sophisticated end-to-end -end orchestration. So the monitoring control layer needs to have a very good awareness of all the capabilities and all the features of all the components in that ecosystem in order to be able to orchestrate them in a very intelligent and efficient manner to create that agility. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So these, uh, so it, it's, 
it's very much now a, a supply chain view of the industry as well. You talk about orchestration, yeah. uh, everything is becoming more like a factory. You mentioned automation as well, and we will come back to this uh, uh, later as well. But I wanted to stay a little bit more on the IP transition. Uh, how do you see it at the moment? What's the state of adoption of IP at the moment from your perspective? And what are the challenges that remain to be addressed, uh, uh, both by buyers and suppliers? Uh, you know, Lorenzo, I would say we're just dipping our toes in the water here. Okay, we're just getting started. And if you ask that question, I think most people will, will start referring to the standardization that is going on. We all talk about NMOS, we all talk about SD2110, for example, and we have to acknowledge the fact that there have been huge efforts done already in the industry. I mean, some very dedicated, some very smart people and some very renowned industry organization, they, they put their heart and soul into this. And, and they already achieved great results in terms of standardization and, and building the building blocks uh, for those future broadcast and media systems. Then again, I mean, we also have to recognize the fact that there's still some fundamental things that have to be taken care of, okay? We could talk about, for example, unified discovery and provisioning of resources in, in these networks. There's still uh, a little bit of a gap that's still shaping up, for example. The buyers have made it very clear in the last, let's say, last year or so, uh, towards uh, the, the technology providers that there needs to be more attention for security, which is one of the huge challenges in those very connected ecosystems. But all in all, I would say, I mean, the first implementations are rolling out. Um, there's some workarounds here and there uh, just to compensate for certain things that are not taken care of yet. But uh, all in all, I would say that's to be expected. Um, but when we talk about this, you know, I have always the feeling we're talking about the nuts and bolts here of how we're going to be putting in place a full-fledged, you know, uh, operation on, on top of an IP stack. And that's fine, you know, but when you talk about the state of it, you know, the state of the transition, I don't like the word state of transition. You know, I'm not a big fan of it. And, and the reason is I do understand where it's coming from. It's coming from the fact that we move from a legacy, you know, infrastructure, very broadcast and media specific to an IP infrastructure. But you have to realize if you look at what's really happening, okay, and the things I've been explaining, you have to realize that the broadcast and media industry will be in a constant state of transition. It's not because you put that technology in there that you're finished, okay? You will be in a constant state of transition. You will constantly evolve. You will constantly be in a state of what we call becoming. And you can, you can see that very clearly. You know, if you take a simple example, Lorenzo, like the internet, Okay, the internet has been around from since the 80s and in the 90s and the subsequent decades. If I'm gonna send you back to the 80s, you're not gonna recognize that as the internet. The internet was something fundamentally different. If we look towards the future, the internet is also going to evolve to become something which is omnipresent in our lives with IoT and 5G and all that. It will be something that will be completely different as the internet that we know today. In a very similar fashion, once the broadcast and media industry has those nuts and bolts in place, you know, it will come into a state of continuous transition and it will evolve and change identity continuously, you know, based on how the market and the industry is going to evolve. So I'm not too worried about, you know, getting the final nuts and bolts into place in terms of building the infrastructure, but it's about, you know, how is this industry going to adapt also to that new state of being normal, okay? How are we going to leverage the agility of the new technology how are we going to evolve towards that state of continuous transition? And that's really, you know, today I see too many people that just embrace IP, but sometimes in a way that they're not clearly looking at, okay, what's going to happen after that? Once I have that IP stack in there, what's going to be expected from me, you know, to go into that continuous evolution? So I think that's a very important thing that people need to contemplate on. No, very interesting. So the new normal is a constant evolution for the broadcaster media industry. And one challenge that a lot of broadcasters we talk to always mention is skill set when moving to IP networks. Do you see that as a challenge for uh, your customers uh, uh, going forward, especially as the, uh, as we always say, the um, uh, the balance of power shifts a little bit away from the traditional broadcast engineering towards uh, uh, IT engineers. 
And I understand that. I mean, I understand that people are concerned about that because obviously the broadcast and media industry is exposed to a complete new set of technologies, IP virtualization. You cannot even capture that into a single skill set. It's a complete stack of new skills and it, it's, it's about endless you know, technologies and, and things that we need to learn about. And even to make it even worse, um, you know, the hottest thing in town is going to be probably obsolete by the end of the day. So you have that continuous evolution also. So, but I think there's one more thing that people need to recognize if, they, if they're worried about skill sets and all that, because you can go out there, you can try to hire experts, you can set up a whole structure to train your staff and all that. But I think it's also about companies choosing wisely what kind of skills they really need, okay? You have to make the proper choices. You need to say, okay, these are things that are key essential for my operation. And that's what I will focus on. And other things are not that relevant for my type of operation. And just to make that a little bit more, you know, to, to give you an example on that, if you look at the monitoring and control stack and, and, and people know that this is very important, on one side of the spectrum, sometimes I see companies that kind of always go back to the established vendors, um, bespoke vendor domain specific controllers, because it's quick, it's easy. But it's extremely tricky to do that. It can really get you into trouble when it comes to agility, when it comes to leveraging AI, and that's a whole subject on its own. And then sometimes I see, you know, customers where the mainstream IT guys are very dominant and they start, you know, approaching it from a very IT centric approach, deploying an entire stack of tools, which makes it very complex and very difficult to evolve over time. So it's about finding that sweet spot, you know, in that entire spectrum where you say, okay, I can have enough agility, and these are the key capabilities that I need to invest in, okay? So that's very important. But you have to understand that, you know, at the end of the day, it's not only going to be about skill sets. The technology that we're going to see, the technology that we're going to need is going to be an absolute must. We, we, we briefly mentioned already machine learning. I mean, today we have monitoring and control solutions that basically, you know, look at 10,000s of metrics simultaneously, continuously, 24-7, doing very sophisticated anomaly detection. This is not something that you can do with skills. And you have to be very careful there in a the sense that, okay, if you go to one side of the spectrum, you will never be able to do that because you're basically locked into a specific architecture with limited capabilities. If you go all the way to the other side of the spectrum, you find yourself in a world where you're gonna have to have you know, experts in machine learning to write the algorithms for you. So you're not, you need to find that sweet spot there to basically position and build your stack in a way that you can focus on the things that are really important, which is essentially workflow, for example, and orchestration capabilities. Yeah, yeah, very, very interesting. And of course, you mentioned already uh, sometimes my, uh, AI and machine learning, which is, of course, a big topic in the industry and in support as well, which is one of the main application areas, according to our research. So what's what role... Uh, does AI have in the future of uh, support and monitoring solution in, in your opinion? Uh, if you could expand a little bit on that. Uh, I think AI and machine learning is, is going to be an absolute must. Okay, it, it, there's no doubt. Um, people may consider it an option uh, today, but tomorrow they will find themselves in, in a world where it's simply impossible to do that. Um, the kind of ecosystems that we're seeing are complete, very complex, you know, a lot of metrics, a lot of data that is continuously coming into the system. These are things, for example, you know, I always try to illustrate this with a very simple example. If I give you a 100 servers and I ask you to manage one simple thing, which is the CPU load, how are you going to do that? And just doing that by putting thresholds, the traditional way of monitoring becomes impossible because a CPU load, it does go up and down. Okay, and some CPU load on a transcoding, you know, is going to be constant and steady. Another CPU load feeding an OTT, uh, you know, into, into the CDN is going to go up and down depending on traffic. And there's a lot of different behaviors. You need machine learning and AI to basically look at all the metrics, be able to understand how they behave, and to be able to, to, to flag to you any anomalies that occur in these ecosystems. And that's just one example. Um, today, we are showcasing already technology where you know, uh, platforms have the ability to look at many months and years of history, okay? All the alarm messages, all the trend and performance data, and to basically use that to automatically understand and build a model of the operational ecosystem. And for example, even 
if the system itself does not have any information about relations between different components, because of the behavior where components interact with each other and influence each other, the AI actually learns that there's a relationship there and uses and leverages that information to, for example, do automatic correlation. So essentially, I would say it's going to be an absolute must. And I think this, this is something that we see everywhere. And it's something that is just going to be a natural evolution of what software is in the future. Okay, interesting. So is that a kind of uh, unsupervised learning uh, pattern recognition? So uh, yes. science relationship that you've not programmed before? Yeah, It's, it's a whole yeah. spectrum of, yeah. uh, of, of, it's a very specific uh, niche, uh, you know, I would say expertise. Uh, yeah. For example, at Skyland, we're a software vendor. This is not something that we could task our software engineering with. We had to set up a complete team of people that are really, you know, specialists in this specific area. And this is more about math and statistics and, and all those things. So it's a very specific expertise to be able to, to do that. So you, are, you also had to change internally in terms of uh, skill sets that, that, that you've needed to develop these uh, features in your product. Most, most definitely, most yeah. definitely. And um, they're in high demand. Uh, you know, you're pretty much competing with banks and the finance industry. Yeah. They all want these people. Yeah, uh, and with AI and ML systems, uh, when we talk to broadcasters, uh, uh, they always tell us that one of the most difficult thing to get right is the data side. So what I mean by this is data integration between different sources, which is sometimes messy at broadcast and media organization. Do you, do you agree with this? And uh, uh, are you finding this is a problem uh, for your customers as well? I, I agree with you know, the statement that if, if your data is not properly structured and all of that, you have a problem. I mean, data is the fuel for AI and machine learning. First of all, machine learning needs to learn from that data in order to be able to start doing something, okay? Um, and it's one of the key mistakes. People are not organized in a proper way. And I always say, you know, if you have a pile of rubble, you're not gonna build a palace on top of that, okay? <laughs> you have to have a solid foundation. And a solid foundation is, you know, the data. And more specifically, I would say it's about the data hygiene. So you have different metrics, different pieces of information. Um, if you take them from many different systems, they all come in different forms and shapes. And, and one, one item might be in megabit, another one might be a gigabit or whatever it may be. You might have a, a, a multicast IP address over here, a router label over there, and a service name over there. So all those things become very, very important. Data hygiene, the granularity, for example, and the context. Uh, the context of the data, uh, because data is not just something that you look at as a point, okay? You look at all the other information around it. Um, and as I mentioned, granularity is also very important. And it's a bit of a legacy, I would say. In the industry, in the past, a lot of people have deployed different silos uh, for different types of the operations. So everybody was always looking at, you know, one project at a time and making decisions for that specific project. And that results in multiple you know, silos and operational platforms that have been installed with no attention at all. So in a sense, I would say, you know, it's not difficult. It's not difficult at all. It's not a problem, but it's just the biggest mistake that we always make is it's an afterthought. Okay. It's an afterthought. The rubble is there already. And then we have a problem. If we would grow more towards an industry where you know, we don't allow different teams to make independent decisions every time, not to deploy continuously in different silos, and not really just to look at very narrow use cases within a specific application. If there would be more central guidance, more overall considerations, you would simply not have that problem. And you can see that because the way we do it, for example, it, we can really focus on the algorithms, we can focus on the AI, because we have that foundation, we have structured data, we have context, we have granularity. And at that, and at that point in time, you know, you can really focus on what matters. Interesting, because sometimes I heard the opposite from some broadcasters saying that the modeling part was easy, maybe because <laughs> uh, it wasn't as developed, but, uh, but the data side was the most difficult to get right. So it's, so it's interesting that also this rubble concept as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to talk, talk about uh, so the transition to software as well, because this, of course, has a, a variety of uh, implications for uh, suppliers in your segment, but also for, for customers. Uh, uh, how do you see uh, 
uh, sorry if I'm using this word, as, uh, again, uh, as you see this transition uh, to software in uh, support at the moment? Um, we, we see the same trends, uh, I think, and that's not surprising. Uh, we, we see it everywhere. It's a trend that is, is omnipresent, uh, supplying software as a service. Um, of yeah. course, sometimes in the industry, we have to be a little bit careful about what is the difference between on-premises, off-premises, software as a service, and all those things. There's a lot of different yeah. flavors and all of uh, and with all the different uh, options that you have. And we see the exactly uh, same thing. And of course, Deploying cloud-based systems, for example, uh, software as a service, uh, in some cases, also on-premises, has a lot of advantages. It makes it more easy accessible. If you're a startup company, you don't have huge funds, you can really de-risk um, the, the entire investment. You don't have to make that huge upfront investment. Yeah. Um, you can scale it, you can uh, deal with peak demand and all those things. But there's one thing, Lorenzo, I would like to say that yeah. kind of worries me sometimes a little bit more. It's... I think people have to be conscious about the choices that they're making. And I know, for example, certain things are kind of hot and new and, and, but automatically saying that everything belongs in the cloud, everything has to be as a service, for example. Um, I think that sometimes uh, is, is a mistake. Okay. Um, sometimes people make too much the assumption, for example, if you move something to the cloud, I don't have to care about, availability. I don't have to care about security um, and all those things. Reality is you do have to do that. You still have to design your systems. You'd still have to build your systems. And if you look at the actual cost of a cloud deployment, it's much more than what you're paying for that specific service. You need to think about, for example, a strategy where you say, hey, I don't want to be locked in with a specific vendor, for example. So you need to develop a multi-cloud strategy. There's a lot of examples of things going on in the industry, for example, major outages, even on the biggest platforms, and you really have to design for that. Um, there's some great articles on the, uh, that you can find about Netflix, for example, and how they design their systems. But even if you go into the cloud, you have to be very conscious about you know, what it is that you're doing, why you're doing it, and take care of certain things, like, for example, developing a multi-cloud strategy and for example, reducing risk. Yeah, because also customers want to have uh, best of breed workflows in the cloud as well. So exactly. choosing choosing a certain provider for cert, a certain kind of work. Yeah, yeah, we, we found uh, uh, the same uh, uh, in our research as well. And these, what you said uh, uh, leads very well to another question I wanted to uh, ask you. And because with so many technologies entering the industry, uh, um, the, the industry, uh, each participant in the industry is getting closer to each other. So uh, buyers are getting closer to vendors with, for example, partnerships or acquisitions and vendors need to be to get closer to each other, for example, for interoperability. Do you see that as an important uh, development uh, also in the future? It's a general development, but I have to say, for example, for us, it's, it has been less applicable. I mean, we have been always very close with our customers and we've always work with them in a continuous relationship in a very collaborative uh, way. Um, it might have to do with the nature of what it is that we're doing uh, and the way we do it. Um, but in our line of business, you know, we've never been in a situation where we do a one-off delivery. I mean, we engage into a continuous relationship. Um, of course, that relationship is evolving. Uh, we are also evolving more towards you know, continuous delivery, continuously adding value to our customers, for example. If I talk about AI and machine learning, for example, to give you uh, just one yeah. example there. Um, our customers, you know, typically have on-premises um, systems. Um, the reason for that is they're very compute intensive. Um, they're very uh, data in and output uh, intensive. Um, so it makes sense to kind of have that on-premises. But for example, if you look at AI and machine learning, we have a cloud component that enables us to share, for example, knowledge between different systems. So on a daily basis, on a continuously uh, you know, increasing basis, we can add value to each on-premises system by you know, adding new knowledge and new expertise uh, to those systems. So it's kind of keeping a balance between that, that relationship is evolving, but you know, at the end of the day, we've always been working very closely with our customers. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you for that. And uh, I have a last question as well. Uh, and I will finish again with, uh, with general. So what do you see, although I 
uh, I think I, I expect a, a specific answer from you as well. What do you see as the next big thing in the support category of the uh, BAM content chain? Um, collaboration. That's okay. it, Lorenzo. I think I was expecting AI and, um, and uh, you know, no, I mean, uh, you know, we as we outlined, everything is changing. Okay, the yeah. very nature of the systems that we're implementing. Um, we see tremendous opportunity. It goes hand in hand with tremendous challenges. And yeah. we know agility is important. Agility is going to, you know, be very definitive. Orchestration is important. Machine learning and AI is very important. But if you really understand what's happening, Lorenzo, it, you know, it shouldn't come as a surprise what I'm saying, because look at the way we organize our work. Look at the way we work with operational squads and DevOps teams and how people need to interact. Look at how you know, traditional companies are evolving towards networks of different uh, people with different expertise that need to work together. Look at how individual ownership is evolving towards, um, you know, a collective ownership of a team, of a group. You cannot expect a single operator today or in the future to basically manage an operation on his own. That used to be possible with a simple playbook. If this happens, look at this, do that, you know, and that kind of things. In those new ecosystems, you won't be able to do that. You need a team of people to basically manage that operation. And another very important observation is also the shift from people using technology to people working hand in hand with technology, okay? Technology is no longer a tool, but technology is more becoming a part of who we are and what we do, okay? That's, that's something that you will see increasingly technology that becomes more omnipresent, something that is not very, you, you know, we're not very conscious about the fact that it's there until it's not there, you know, like electricity, okay? And that's Smart. very important because that's the way we see collaboration and how an operation, a management system has to interact with those different people, those different agile teams of people that could be at different locations. And we strongly believe, for example, that, the days that you run an operation by putting people in the same physical room, a typical network operation center or an MCR, those days are going to be, you know, disappearing. You're going to be managing something with a, a team of experts. They could be on different locations and they all need to collaborate on that. And I have to say, we, we've, we've shown the first results of, of our development in, in that specific area uh, back in June when we did a, se a seminar. And I mean, the customers were really astonished. They saw how, people can interact with the operation in a completely different way, way more agile, and how they can really use their operational support systems to empower people to work efficiently and easily. So this is really something new that we're gonna be launching. And one last thing, if I can, that I would like to add to that is the fact that we have orchestration, end-to-end -end orchestration, you have AI and machine learning, we're talking about collaboration and interaction with people, but those are not standalone components. Those are components that can really interact with each other. And that's when you see the magic. You know, that's when you start seeing the new style, the new way, and the new generation of management systems and how it allows you to deal with those complex uh, environments. Okay. Okay, great. That was great. Uh, thanks, Ben. And it's nice to finish on collaboration and coming back to complexity as well.